Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's book launch and webinar, How Smart is Lightroom? AI-powered photo editing with author and photographer, Jeff Carlson. My name is Katie Walker and I am the marketing coordinator here at Rocky Nook. And I am delighted to welcome you all today and to be your host and moderator. We're going to be getting started in just a minute to give some more attendees time to join the webinar room. But in the meantime, while we're waiting, you can enter your name into the chat or feel free to say hi to our presenter, Jeff. Welcome everyone. If you've just joined us and you're here for our live online webinar, How Smart is Lightroom? AI Powered Editing with Jeff Carlson. You've come to the right place. We're going to be getting started in just a minute. While we wait for some more attendees to join, please feel free to share with us where you're joining us from. Like we have a really great international presence with some people from Canada, Australia. Welcome. All right, we may have some more participants who will be joining us in progress, but for now we're going to get started. A couple things to note for those of you who are here. If you have to leave for any reason during the webinar presentation, this will be recorded and it will be hosted to Rocky Nook's online YouTube channel, as well as the recording will be emailed to everybody who registered. Whatever burning questions you may have for Jeff during his webinar tutorial, please enter those into the Q&A at any point throughout the webinar, and we will moderate those at the end. Today, we have over 350 registered attendees for this webinar. So for those of you who are unfamiliar to Rocky Nook, we are a small independent publisher local to the Bay Area in California. We were founded in 2006 with the goal of publishing books that would help all level photographers improve their skills to capture those moments that matter. We are very excited to welcome Jeff Carlson as we celebrate his new book, Adobe Lightroom, a complete course and compendium of features. Jeff's book is currently available in ebook form, print format, and also in a bundled edition from the Rocky Nook online store. If you have yet to purchase Jeff's book, you can buy it from Rocky Nook's online store with an amazing 40% off discount that works for the print book, the ebook, and for the bundle. And that coupon code, which I will be putting in the chat is Carlson40. We ask that if you buy and read Jeff's book, that you leave him a review at any retailer online, Barnes & Noble, our store, Amazon, as this supports Rocky Nook to keep bringing you the books that we publish, but also helps to support Jeff as the author. And now to introduce Jeff Carlson. Author and photographer Jeff Carlson writes for publications such as DP Review and Creative Pro and is a contributing editor at Tidbits. He is the author of numerous books, including Adobe Lightroom, a course, complete course and compendium of features, the Photographer's Guide to Luminar AI, which is above my shoulder on the shelf. Take Control of Your Digital Photos, Take Control of Your Digital Storage, and Take Control of Apple Watch. He also co-hosts the podcasts Photoactive and Photocombobulate, and he leads photography workshops in the Pacific Northwest. Jeff believes there's never enough coffee, and he does his best to test that theory. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Carlson. Now it's my turn to jump in, I think. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> so good to have you all here. Ah, oh, boy, here we go. Um, all right. My first couple of things I want to say, um, I have a quick 
um, keynote deck that just has a few things that we're going to cover. Um, I want to apologize if any of you are disappointed that there's a human leading this because I know there's AI in the title and well, that's kind of the way things are these days. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the very, very cool features in Lightroom that um, honestly have changed the way that I have been editing my photos for the last couple of years in really fundamental ways. So we're going to start. Let's go directly to this. Of course, we started at the end because I've never done this before. No, I have. Um, a couple of quick things. Uh, to find more about me in general, if you're not familiar with who I am, if you don't have the book, um, I, uh, I'm putting this link here. Uh, you don't have to copy it. Katie will send you this in a uh, in a follow up email. But basically, this just gives links to the things that I do, link to buy the book, and a couple of resources from uh, the talk that we're going to do today. And just in case you didn't know, oh, here's my book. Um, I am unreasonably proud of this book, um, partially because when you write a book, you sort of put a lot of yourself into it. So all the photos in there, except for a couple are all mine. I really love the way they turned out. Uh, but, and you know this because you know Rocky Nook. Rocky Nook does a great job of printing and color. And so if you buy this book, like a print book, it looks fabulous. Um, as someone who's done a lot of books, most of my books have also looked good because I've worked with uh, you know, Peach Pit in the past and Rocky Nook. Um, but some books now, they aren't as good. And Rocky Nook takes the time and the quality and takes it seriously. So um, use the code Carlson40 to get 40% off. This can be either the print book or the eBooks uh, or a bundle of both. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to get out of the way here is... Uh, Lightroom Classic versus Lightroom. Now, normally I would ask, you know, who who uses which one? Um, I'm primarily going to be working in Lightroom Classic. Um, and if you own the book, most of what's covered in there is Lightroom Classic. However, everything that I'm talking about exists in both programs and they just look slightly different. And in terms of the book, everything in the book also applies to both programs except in the cases of like Lightroom Classic not having, um, I'm sorry, Lightroom Desktop not having some features that Lightroom Classic does. So if if you use regular Lightroom or Lightroom Desktop, um, first of all, curse Adobe for their terrible naming scheme that has created confusion for years. Uh, but second of all, uh, if what I'm showing you looks slightly different, that's okay. It's still going to work the same. That's kind of the important thing. I also want to point out one more thing that um, everything that I'm covering is in the book, except for one feature, which is lens blur, which came out just in the last major releases. And that is going to be in an addendum that I'm currently working on that will be a free download for anybody who owns the book. There's a, a resources page uh, if, if you own the book, you'll know there's a link where you can download images to work with and also the addendum when it's ready um, that will cover all the new stuff. So, all right, I think we got all that out of the way. So, is Lightroom smart? Of course it's smart. Uh, but when we're talking about smart, we're talking about um, specifically AI and machine learning. And I know you've heard all sorts of things about these terms. Um, what Lightroom does not do is create things from text prompts. And this is kind of where a lot of the, a lot of the attention has been when it comes to AI in, in the photography realm. Um, and like, that's, that's cool. That's its own thing. Um, but what I like and what I prefer to do, um, and this is also the case. So one of the things in that linked list that, that I do. I also write a newsletter about um, AI and machine learning that is changing photography. Um, it's called the, the Smarter Image. And one of the things that I've been focusing on is not 
hey, I can just type something and have it magically created. It's how these technologies are being used as tools to augment what you're currently doing and maybe speed things up dramatically. So that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about here. Um, and I mean, some of this stuff, it's just really cool. Um, I know that makes me sound like a, I don't know, little fanboy for technology, but um, it's really cool, especially if you have spent time in the past fighting with some of these types of, of edits. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, denoising. We're gonna talk about lens blur, um, which is also bokeh. And I know some people, uh, one of my podcast co-hosts does not even like to say the word. Uh, and we're also gonna talk about masking and masking has just been incredible. And if you think that you have a handle on sort of basic masking, uh, I'm going to show a couple of things that might blow your mind. If it doesn't blow your mind, that's okay too, but it's still fun to do. All right. First of all, real quick, um, and I should probably say, I am going to blow through these, th these topics fairly fast so that we can have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so first of all, let's get on the same page about AI. Um, when you saw this picture, so here's a picture um, that when I look at it, I see there's a woman standing in a field in front of some sunflowers. And that's great. That's, that's what you and I know because we know these things, but a computer doesn't know that. A computer just sees pixel, 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 and then different colors and different hues. So what AI and machine learning is all about is taking a whole bunch of images, like millions and millions of images, and feeding them into a software model. Um, yeah, that that that's me on the right. Uh, and that's not the software model, by the way. Um, but what this is doing is it identifies things in the images, and it's all kinds of images, so that next time the the computer sees this, it's not just seeing colored pixels. It's able to say, oh, this is roughly the shape of something that I know as a human. And the, the things behind the human uh, have leafy shapes and yellow petals, and those match what I quote unquote know as sunflowers. And that top area is probably the sky because it has this gradation. And usually when there's a person, there's a sky uh, at the you know top third of the picture. All of these things that it knows because it has looked at millions of images that are like this. So, um, so how does that help us? When the software can know things about the image, it can do interesting things with them. So before, you know, with Photoshop, you're just pushing pixels around. You're manipulating uh, different colors. You're saying, make this color, that color. But now we can take advantage of this knowledge to do really cool and interesting things. So for the first thing I want to talk about is denoising. And when it comes to how things are trained for denoising models, um, it's not so much it's it's looking at what objects are in the scene. It can also look at the characteristics of the image. So um, basically they feed a whole bunch of noisy images, like an image at different ISO values. So you have really noisy and then not noisy, and it makes the connections to figure out how to go from one to the other. All right, let's put this into practice. I'm gonna jump into Lightroom Classic. All right. So here's an image that uh, I took in Italy. Um, this was actually at the end of a night where I was uh, <laughs> fighting for a spot in the Plaza Michelangelo uh, in Florence. Um, literally like dozens and dozens of people behind me, but I got a wonderful sunset. I was all tired, uh, walking back to my hotel, and then this happened. And so I got my camera out and I just, you know, I think I, I had it on auto ISO and snapped this picture. And I, I love the colors. I love everything about this. 
However, this is a very noisy image. Now, I'm hoping that the connections that we have between us uh, will show the extent of, of the noise of this. So this was shot at ISO 6400. So, um, oh, and this is on a um, uh, Fuji X-T3. So not a current model, it's a few years old, but, um, you know, it's it has some characteristics of grain and that's that's fine, but you can't get away that this is this is digitally noisy. So what are we gonna do about it? And if I bring this into the develop module. Now in the past, what we would do is we would go into the detail and we would go down to noise reduction and we'd start throwing sliders. So we'll get some, increase some luminance noise reduction, maybe add some detail. And what you see here is definitely less noisy, but it's also very smudgy, right? And so that's just been the bane of, of, of noisy photographs to the extent that oftentimes you'll have something that, you know, a photo that you'd love that maybe you just never edited because it just wasn't worth it. It would just turn into this sort of mess right here. But we don't have to do that anymore. So I'm going to reset the manual controls. And there's a button here that says denoise. And this is part of the, the enhance set of tools that will, uh, in this case, it is, it is taking the raw file. And I should also point out, um, denoise only works on raw files. And there are a few DNG files like, like Apple Pro Raw that it won't work on. But basically, most in most cases, uh, most raw files, it'll do this because it's it's reprocessing. It's, it's uh, doing the whole demosaicing step and noise reduction at the same time. Um, we have just a little slider. So I'm let's going to say we're going to do 70 or so. And we click Enhance. And what this is going to do is it's going to run a little bit of uh, its own little magic and take all the, the algorithms that it knows about how to, not just how to deal with noise, but it knows how to deal with noise from a photo captured with a Fuji X-T3. And as you can see, this is pretty darn good. We have a lot of detail. We don't have much noise. And also keep in mind that this is at 200%. So you know, when we zoom out, even if we go into 100%, like that still looks pretty good. If I wanted to, I could probably, like if it seemed a little too clean, then maybe I could add some, some grain to it. That often makes things look, look pretty good. But you know, if we wanted to compare this, So we have, you know, uh, original noisy on the right and cleaned up non-noisy on the left. It's really, really amazing. And literally all I did was just click that, that button, increase that slider, and that was it. Um, it does create a brand new file, which is important to know. So you can always go back and, and reprocess the original. You can't like do denoise on top of denoise on on this image. Like once it's it's done, it's done. Um, but then you can you know make your other edits as you see fit. So that's that's pretty cool. But you're like, okay, well that's that's a fairly modern camera. It did a fairly okay job. What if we throw something like really bad at it? Something that would otherwise be thrown away. Um, I, I love examples like this. So, so this was shot with a Fuji X-T1 many years ago. And if I zoom in here, you can see, I mean, this is just garbage. There's just, there's, there's white, uh, you know, blown out pixels in all the dark areas. You can kind of tell that that's a person um, like this, the area down here with the lanterns isn't too bad, but you know, it's, it's not great. So Let's throw denoise at it. And I will just crank this up just sort of randomly. Obviously, um, you know, demo rules apply. I'm going to do things quickly. Um, I probably, you know, 
maybe try a couple of different examples. You have a preview there, which helps so you can see what, whether that's gonna be working or not. But when we zoom in here, 200%. I mean, holy cow, this now becomes a usable image. So, and if we wanna compare that real quick, Move this over here. Like, I don't know. That's that that it impresses me. Um, I am easily impressed, but that's not the point. Um, I'm going to throw a couple of um, best practices and tips for denoids, and th this will be on that uh, resource page that I mentioned earlier. Um, you want to do denoids early. Uh, preferably before you do any other AI um, type edits. Um, you can add grain. Um, if you want to bypass the dialogue, you can hold option or alt and click that button. Um, you can batch process several images. So let's say you have like five or six from one time period that are all kind of noisy. You can just hit them all. Um, and then also this is, you know, um, you want something that has a, pre a decent GPU, um, preferably with neural processors, so that um, it won't take a long time. I'm doing this on a MacBook Pro with an M1 Max processor. So it's fairly speedy. Um, you know, your mileage will vary based on the, uh, the, the hardware that you have. But still, wow, right? Okay. Now, as I turn over my paper notes here, just in case, you never can tell. Okay. Let's talk about lens blur. And you're like, oh, not lens blur. Like, do we need any more fake backgrounds? Um, so if you know, uh, if you've used any sort of smartphone, recent smartphone, there's a portrait mode. And the portrait mode will take an image of of what you're shooting and it will process in real time what it thinks is in that image and create a depth map. So in this case, this is a picture, this is shot with a um, iPhone 15 Pro and uh, this doesn't have any, any portrait mode um, applied. And what, it, what it's done is, if you recall what I was saying about how the AI and the machine learning works, it's looked at the scene and said, oh, there's a person there. So I'm going to create a depth map of the person because the person is probably a subject. Now, the reason that we have these tools is because smartphone cameras in particular, the, the, the sensors and the lenses, they're just too small to really create that natural depth of field. So what it does instead is it creates a, an artificial depth of field. And the early ones were really obvious. Now the technology is really advanced. And in Lightroom specifically, because that's what we're talking about here, um, they can take advantage of that in two ways. It'll either use the depth map that the phone camera created. So it already has information about what's foreground, what's background, what it thinks is foreground and background. Or if you have an image that was not shot on a smartphone, anything, it will do that analysis and say, okay, well, here's a person and therefore they must be in the foreground, et cetera, et cetera. So let's see how this works in practice. Oh, I should also point out that lens blur is labeled as early access, which basically means Adobe, I think, isn't 100% satisfied with it, but they wanted to put it in the release. And so, you know, like it's, it's not a beta feature, it's an early access feature. Uh, the good news is, it's pretty good. So I'm, you know, I don't think that this is something you should avoid just because it's got that label on it. Okay, so here's the problem with this picture. Um, other than the fact that he is entirely too happy. Uh, we've, we've, we've got him here. We've got this window and you got the glass. It's just, you know, we were having lunch. We'd uh, gone, um, did some photographing in a nearby park, but the background's a bit distracting. You've got those pipes in the back, you've got the, the paneling on the wall. And so even though he is taking up much of the frame, we still have distractions for the eye and we don't want that. And we also, this since this is a portrait, we want that, that portrait look, right? 
So if we go to the lens blur panel, um, this is gonna be really difficult. You click apply and it's gonna analyze the, the, the image. And in this case, it's using the depth map that is existing. Uh, there's an option here where you can actually uh, say use device depth, or you can turn that off so that Lightroom will calculate it, but we don't need to do that here. Now, again, this might be a little bit hard to tell over a Zoom call, but the background, if we zoom in, whoa, if we zoom in less than that, <laughs> uh, the background is now a bit blurry. And it's done a really good job of, of isolating him as the subject. I can hide this real quick. So this is before and this is after. And if we want, we can increase or decrease that blur amount. So you have more separation between foreground and background. And um, there are a couple of other cool things about this. So in, in most cases, like a portrait mode, will just just give you that, that blurriness amount um, and then bam, you're done. Uh, here under bokeh, you can set a characteristic for the background blur. So if you wanted to, to simulate this sort of circular uh, pattern or maybe more of a you know, hexagonal uh, shutter effect, um, we, can, we can boost it. We can also, because now we have this data working for us, we can say, you know what, uh, I, Glenn, I, I like you, but I'm actually really more interested in that background. So I can click and target that background area. And so it'll say, oh, you want that part in focus. All right, we'll put that part in focus. Now, as you can see, if I zoom in again, it's not as great. Um, it's really tailored toward, you know, having a foreground person, um, or, sorry, foreground object uh, isolated, et cetera. But we have that possibility and depending on the image that you're working on, maybe that, that works. Um, we can also then, uh, you know, specify, all right, well, maybe we want him in focus, but we only want like a very shallow part of him in focus, right? And at any time we can say visualize depth and this will let us know what the what the software is working with. All right, so that's, that's kind of cool. Um, really quick, what if we have something that does not have a depth map, is not a person, is not something really obvious? So this is this is a fine picture, but there's a whole lot of noise around it. And I just liked this bench on this day. So when I click apply, so you can see that that it's it's blurred a bit here in the background. I'll exaggerate the blur just to make it more obvious. But uh, you know, this tree on the left is not is still kind of sharp. So what I can do is I can say visualize depth. It's done an okay job but I can say, you know what? I actually want more blur on this tree. So I can just basically paint that in. So this gives you control over how and where things are, are in focus. Um, you know, let's say like, I want that sort of toy look uh, and you know, I, I, I can blur the foreground a little bit more. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a person and a quote unquote portrait. You can use selective blurring to, you know, isolate where you want the viewer's eyes to go in, in pretty much anything. So that's pretty cool. That's lens blur. All right, I'm gonna take a drink of water. Now we're gonna have a lot of fun. Because now we get to talk about masking. Now, uh, I think I mentioned this before. It is not an exaggeration to say that Lightroom masking has changed the way I edit photos, um, landscape photos, portrait photos, kind of anything. And part of it is because I know what I can do with them. But part of it is because it's doing stuff that would have either taken way too much time or was beyond my technical capabilities or, you know, just stuff that was super hard or super, I guess, super unable. That's a really, really bad way of saying it. Excuse me while I get rid of that. Um, so what am I talking about here? Again, let's go back to 
that idea of uh, the computer, the software knows about what's in the frame. So here's a picture of uh, two, a, a couple, um, I did some engagement photos for them. And I really like this, this little hallway here, or I guess alley, I don't know, space between buildings, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I look at this and I'm like, it's, it, it's good, but I want more focus on them. Okay. Um, this is like, I've already done some, some basic edits to it. Uh, but let's say they were a little bit too dark. Now, one way to bring up the, the light values just on them in the past, you would have to grab a brush and just, you know, paint over the areas that you wanted, um, or you would, you know, push it off into Photoshop. I don't want to do that now because I don't have time for all that. What I want to do is I just want to make them a little bit brighter. So I'm going to click subject and it's going to detect the subject. Now what it's done, and literally it only took a couple of seconds, it has made a mask that includes just them. And let's, I mean, let's take a look at this mask. Like it's gotten the hair pretty good. It's got edges pretty well. Um, you know, his little uh, curl there, um, like it's done a pretty good job. And now with this subject mask selected, um, I can then use all, almost all of the, the normal, um, you know, editing tools, develop tools, and just apply it to that area. So I can like bring up the exposure, um, you know, maybe the color's slightly off, whatever. So that's something that would have taken a long time that now the software is just like, oh yeah, these look like people, that's probably the subject, we'll go with that. But wait, there's more. So let me, I'm gonna delete this real quick because that didn't really solve our problem of having the background being uh, a, a little bit too distracting. So what I'm gonna do instead is, I'm gonna take a, a radial gradient, something that's been in, in uh, Lightroom for a long time, and I'm gonna just make a big gradient here. Because what I wanna do is I wanna make that background a bit darker. And I want to make these walls, even though I love I love the leading lines to it, they're just it's just a little bit too distracting. So I'm going to take my radial gradient, I'm just going to drop the exposure, and there we go. Perfect, right? I have solved all my problems, and of course introduced a new one because now they look horrible. Oh gosh, what am I going to do about this? Because when I did my editing. My, my basic editing, I, you know, I, I was editing for them to try to get them, make them look good. And now I've screwed that up. So I don't want to have to go in and re-edit them. But what I can do is, if we notice here in the masks panel that shows up, so we have the mask that we've created and that the component of that mask is a radial gradient. Well, I can subtract another type of mask from this mask. So in this case, I'm going to say subtract, select subject, and boom. So I have my original edits of them, which I liked, but now they stand out a bit more, the background recedes a little bit more, and if I hadn't been talking about this the whole time, it would have taken me, you know, 30 seconds. Pretty darn cool. Um, let me switch to something else that's pretty darn cool. All right, here is uh, a portrait, portrait done in you know spotty light underneath a tree. Now, what we find with portraits oftentimes is we want people to look a little bit better. We want to do a little bit of retouching. We want to uh, you know maybe smooth their skin a little bit, make their eyes enhanced a bit more. Um, you know, but uh, unfortunately, uh, this guy is like terminally handsome. And so uh, you're like, well, he doesn't need, need much work, but it was a good example to look at. So what we would do in the past is maybe, you know, take a brush and do all sorts of things or, or shoot off to Photoshop and do all sorts of things. We don't have to do that. 
Because if you remember, again, I'm going to hammer this point home, the software knows about this image. This was shot with uh, my mirrorless camera, so there's no depth mask or anything like that. But it can figure out where the subject is. But it's not just that. It can figure out elements of the, of, of the subject. So, for example, when we look over here in our, our mask panel on the right, under people, it says there's person one. Like, oh, well, that's interesting. So it knows that that's a person. And it can make masks for different parts of that person. Eyes, lips, teeth, hair, facial hair, even clothes. It'll figure out which, which clothes that you have there. And you can make separate masks. If I, if I wanted to, I could do like facial skin, body skin, eyes, iris, whatever, and have different masks made of that and then just work on those areas which is pretty darn cool. But even more cool is, I'm going to cancel that. I can go into presets. And there are a bunch of built-in adaptive portraits, sorry, adaptive presets for portraits. So I can say, just run the enhanced portrait. And what this has done is it has created a bunch of um, like like those things, like the the, the facial skin, the the eyes, the irises and pupil. And what it's done is, let me zoom in a bit. Like it's applied typical portrait retouching things to this area. So for example, like the iris and pupil, I can, if I turn that off, turn it back on, like it's added some contrast. It's, it's added some brightness to it. Um, facial skin, it's added some, um, or sorry, it's, it's reduced some of the texture, which smooths it, but you still have like that realistic texture. It's not just a big blur. And that way I can just click this one thing, or you can make your own presets if you've customized some of these and have it apply with just a click. I mean, Think about how long a portrait retouching session can take without this, this type of tool. Now, even better is that, let's say you've done a portrait shoot and you have maybe 10 different pictures of your subject. And the way portrait shoots are, like, like he's not going to be in this position every time. He's going to turn his body. You're going to have him you know look one way or the other. But you want to use all of those images as your final images. Well, once the software knows how to do this, you can copy the, the edits, copy the adjustments, and you can also include the masks and then paste over all of those. So that means even though like his eyes will be in a different part of the frame or his head will be slightly turned, it will find where the eyes and the cheeks and the lips and all of that, it'll find those and then apply the same uh, adjustments that you made before. So instead of having to spend an hour working on five different uh, portrait retouching jobs, you literally, like you do one, you copy and paste, and it just applies it to all of them. Um, I think, you know, uh, wedding photographers are probably like loving this new era because they have so much to process. Okay. Now, let's get into the big guns. This is a picture where, and I'm gonna jump back to the un unedited picture. This is a, a shot um, taken at New Halem, no, not, not New Halem, um, Leavenworth, Washington, excuse me. And uh, the, the dramatic fog in the background is actually uh, uh, fire, forest fire smoke, um, but, when we drove past this, this section of this creek, there was this one yellow tree standing out. And this is a really good example of, like, my eye saw this tree and was like, ooh, that, like, that's a nice pop of color and contrast. And, and so I, you know, we, we parked and I made this image. But what I had in my head was not exactly what the camera uh, captured. But... That didn't bother me too much. And, and there were some things that I was deliberately doing, like I was underexposing because I didn't want the, the sky to be completely blown out. But knowing what I can do with it, specifically with masks and things, meant that I knew how I could turn this image into what I saw in my head. So um, 
here's an edit. Oops, forget I just showed that. Uh, so he, here's an edit where I've just used the regular editing tools to, uh, you know, bring up some of the shadows. I've um, enhanced some of the yellows. That's, you know, what what really uh, popped out to me. Um, but it's it's just not quite there. So what else can I do with this? All right. So let me identify some problems real quick. Uh, I think the smoky sky could be more atmospheric. Um, I want the, that yellow tree to pop even more. Uh, the water, because I increased the white balance, the water is kind of, you know, brown, muddy looking. It doesn't really look like water. Um, and these rocks in the foreground, like they're just a little bit too dark. So I'm going to blow through these really quickly, but show you a few ways to 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 deal with that. So for example, like for the smoky sky, I can create a linear gradient and just drag that through the sky and then apply, so hide that real quick. Um, so I can like take the dehaze, push that up, push the clarity up so we have a little bit more drama in the sky. Now, re remember when you create a mask of any type, these tools over here on the right are just applying to that mask. All the other edits are down below, but the, the mask specific ones show up at the top when you have one selected. Okay, so there's the sky. Um, the yellow tree. Oh, yellow tree, what are we gonna do about you? We're gonna zoom in on you for the first part. Um, so another type of mask we can create and it's a little weird that when, you, when your first mask is over here on the right, and then you have this masks panel that shows up, um, it, you get used to it. Um, all right, so, so you know we can do shapes and brushes and all of that, but we can also do something like a color range. So I want to select just this range of yellows, right? And I can refine that so that it, it you know, really applies just to the yellows there, or maybe Maybe I want to go with the greens. That's about this and make it really rough. Um, and then maybe I want to do, you know, I want to like push the temperature up a little bit. Or um, I can use point color, which is a new feature, which is cool. And I can say like, I want all the yellows to be like a little bit more yellow or a little bit more saturated. I think I just made them more green. You know how uh, when you're watching Bob Ross and he does something, you're like, no, you've ruined it, you crazy man. Well, I did ruin it. But the point stands, uh, you know, like, and maybe I want to increase the exposure a little bit. So things that I can really make that pop a bit more. So not entirely successful uh, trying to do it quickly, but you get the idea. All right, what about the water? Water is, you know, um, one thing I could do is take a take a, a brush and paint through all this and drive myself mad. I don't want to do that. Instead, I'm going to do a luminance range because, you know, the water is, is some of the brightest uh, areas of the image. So if I click here, and then I can change my refinement here so that it's, uh, where are you, where are you? There we go, sorry. I can refine how much of the water is being selected. And I know some of you are like, um, uh, Jeff, are you looking at the top of your image? Uh, I am, but we're gonna hold on to that for one, one second. So then I can like push my whites up a little bit maybe and bring my temperature down, which is the important part of this. Uh, this is great for like long exposure waterfall shots where you just want to affect the waterfall itself. Like, like maybe, you know, uh, pull back on the highlights a little bit so you get more of that texture. And you're like, okay, great. We've fixed the water-ish. Um, but obviously it also affected all the area up above because with the luminance mask, it's, it's just looking for bright values. You're like, okay, well, we've done, we've kind of screwed that up now. What do we make another uh, like linear gradient to, to, to sort of offset the change we've made? No, because there's a 
quasi hidden feature that's super cool. So over here in the mask tool, mask panel, um, we have an add button if we wanted to add to this mask and the subtract button if we wanted to subtract like we showed before. But if you hold option or alt, you get intersect. Click that, I'm gonna intersect a linear gradient. And when I draw this up here, what it's going to do is only the area where these two masks intersect will apply the adjustments that I made. So now I've got this and we'll like cool this off just to make this, this a lot more uh, obvious. Like it's only applying to the bottom half of, of the brightest areas in the image. And this is also something that, you know, we can, we can, you know, adjust. Maybe I, you know, I, I messed this up and I need to put, uh, push it up there. Um, all of these things are, are malleable and you're not, um, you know, obviously everything is non-destructive, so you're not really screwing up anything. You're sort of building and applying in specific controlled ways. Um, oh, and then uh, foreground rocks, last thing I wanted to show for this one. Um, normally I would take a brush to these, but there's also this cool object selection. And what this will do is, um, in, in this case, it's gonna do a good job of picking out edges, um, but it also looks for objects. Again, going back to it knowing what's in the image. Um, it, like if I had a car here, I could paint over the car and it would say, oh, that sort of looks like a car and I'm gonna select the car. So when I do this, it's gonna detect the objects and it's done a pretty good job of grabbing things without you know, me having to very specifically go in and, and, and paint. Um, it kind of missed a little bit here if I wanted to, you know, do another, um, you know, an add to that. But for now, all I'm going to do is just take this, bring the shadows up a little bit, maybe the blacks up just to give a little bit more, more visible texture there. And again, going back to this thing I'm gonna hit over and over, like it only took me a few seconds to do that. So I could use, um, here's, here's, here's a version where I've edited it in the past. This is quite nice. And this is close to what I saw when I was there. Is it, you know, historically accurate? No, this isn't journalism. This is uh, a, a landscape piece where that tree stood out and I can go into Lightroom and make what I saw happen in the image because everything that's there was already in the image, all the colors, everything. I'm just uh, accentuating or minimizing or boosting different colors and, and tones for that. So whew, that is a very quick overview of AI and machine learning stuff in Lightroom. Uh, let's open it up for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And looks like we do have some questions. I will try my best to answer as many as we can. And um, Oh, and wait, before I do that, um, I do want to mention, I should probably share my screen again. Um, one thing to please keep in mind is that coming up in January, we will be having um, a, a masterclass where I'm going to spend two hours taking pictures that are, you know, like it says, transform so-so shots into great photos. Um, shots kind of like this last one where I saw the potential and I took the shot, but maybe I had to underexpose so I wouldn't blow out highlights and then bring them into Lightroom and, and walk through exactly how to make these, these images better. So that's coming up. Uh, there will be a link. You can go to rockynook.com events, um, or there will be a link in the email that Katie sends you um, so you can uh, register there. Okay, questions. And water. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Thanks for that tutorial. I'm just going to add that link into the chat right now. That's for Jeff's um, event in January that we're going to be hosting. And I will send out more information about that in the follow-up email to this. But uh, let's get to the Q&A because we already have some, some healthy questions. Uh, 
Linda just posted in the chat. She wants mm -hmm. to confirm that those photos were all raw files you were using. They were, most of them were raw files. The, um, the, the lens blur ones, those were just, um, uh, Heath files, uh, captured by the, the, um, uh, the iPhone. So, um, which is like a JPEG, but it's got more information wrapped up into it. Um, that, that's the, the standard, um, iPhone, uh, file format. Um, uh, so all the stuff that I, that I showed you, you can use on JPEGs if you want, except for denoise and denoise only works on raw files. Okay. I think that actually might answer one of the questions. Let me pull that up. Um, somebody wanted to know. Do these features, the denoise and lens blur work with JPEG also? So you just answered yeah. that. Uh, not denoise, but the others, the others do. Um, if, if you needed to denoise a JPEG, there are other tools like Topaz AI, um, on one uh, no noise, I think it's called. Um, so the, there are other things that you could do that actually will work as plugins within Lightroom Classic. Uh, so if you have like just a really noisy old JPEG that you wanted to revitalize, then the option would be to send it out to something like that. Okay, um, Dale actually just asked, what now is the role of Topaz Photo AI? Oh. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, part of what I just said, um, I think, so 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 photo AI will do a lot, it'll do a lot of stuff. So um, it, there's definitely some overlap. Um, one example is, uh, so Lightroom, you can, you can uh, upscale images if you want. Um, so, you know, take a low resolution image and make it larger, but it'll just do a, a, a two X, two times scale. Um, Topaz uh, Photo AI has more options. You can make it, you know, four times larger. Um, and they've worked a lot of their, their AI technologies into it. So for example, let's say you have a fairly low resolution image and there's a person in it. It can process the area where the person is knowing that it's a person and do some um, like skin smoothing and things like that, but also some sometimes basic reconstruction so that it looks like more of a person and less of um you know uh, blurry pixels that have been that have been enhanced so um top has like definitely has um uh, more specific features and more targeted features for this um but i will say that i find the results to be a little bit hit or miss uh sometimes you'll just get little you know unprocessed patches within so in general, Lightroom won't do as much in some of these areas, but um, tends to do a slightly better job in in my opinion, to, to my eyes. Hey, thank you. Um, one of our first questions, so this goes back to when you were doing denoise, is what are some of the considerations that would cause you to use less versus more in the amount when you were using mm. the slider? That's from Peter. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. So basically, with denoise, um, you know, it's it's basically how how much of the processing processing do you want to have happen? Um, if you have a, an image that has that, that's a lot more noisy, like the second one that I showed, then um, you'll probably want to have a more aggressive denoising. If you have something that that maybe has a lot more fine detail that's going to get lost when you when you increase that amount, then maybe you want to denoise less. So so you're not getting rid of all the noise, but you're minimizing it. And then after you run the denoise pass, then maybe you go and you add digital grain, and that kind of balances it out. So you still have like a grainy look, but you've retained some of the some of the detail without that that electronic uh, noise look. Okay. Um, I think you also said you want to use denoise before other AI features, but yeah. uh, Peter asked, do you recommend using denoise before you do any other kinds of edits? Yeah, I think so. Because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, what you're doing is because you're creating a new image. Um, <clears throat> well, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to step back a little bit. Um, your results are probably going to vary depending on the image, but um, what I tend to do is run a denoise pass 
and then you know work on your tones and your colors and all of that because <clears throat> sorry um because then you're you're working on the this other separate photo um if you do all that like like all that is going to change the nature of 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 the noise in in some respects and so um if you then like run denoise at the very end it may not be exactly what you're looking for um you know it I mean, what's great is it's not super intensive. So, you know, try it both ways. Um, or, you know, you, you can even, um, you know, uh, edit your image and then uh, denoise an unedited copy of it and then copy and paste the, the edits from your original image to the denoised one and see how it turns out. Okay, um, we have some, now we have some questions going to the lens blur and um, mask. So the first question on blurring is how does background blur work without the depth data from an iPhone image, like just a normal raw from a camera? Mm. Yeah, so so Lightroom can basically build that depth mode information um, if it's not there. So it, it will do the scanning and 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 figure out what is what is the subject, what is likely the background, and all of that. Um, and so it it makes its guess as to what the depth map should be, and it creates a depth map. So you don't need to start with with a smartphone image. I just happen to have those two, um, and and I think the the second one did not have any it, like it wasn't shot in portrait mode. So um, I think the Having the depth map information helps a little bit, just because when you're taking it with the with an iPhone, it's, it's using two of the lenses to to figure out, uh, you know, optically where there's there are things that are closer or farther apart, and so um, you, you will tend to get slightly cleaner depth maps if you start from something that has a depth map, but it, by no means is it is it required. You can use it on on any of your images. Okay. Um, one question, this might send you into Lightroom, into screen sharing. How do you add areas to the mask that were not picked up by the AI? Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, let me just show that real quick. All right. So let's say, um, <laughs> go here. No. Uh, Nope, that's not masking. Hang on. It's been two minutes and now I've completely forgotten how to use this application. Okay. So let's say we have we have this this picture. And um let's say um and the problem is it, it did a really good job with them. Um but let's pretend that that I I don't know. Let's. Oh, actually, wait. This this might be it. Uh, no, that's still pretty good. All right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna show a different feature to answer this one, uh, because it's it's kind of cool and it will answer the question. All right. So let's say. All right. So we're gonna do. Um, remember how I said that that uh, it, it'll see people. Well, here are two people together, and um, it has figured out where they are. So let's let's do her. So we've created uh, just a mask for her. And let's say um, I, for some reason, want also his hand right there. So what I can do is I can click Add, and I select a type. In this case, I'm just going to say Brush, just to make this easy. And then I can just brush that in. And so in terms of, you do a really poor brush job because that's what you do when you're doing a demo. So um, the way this works is, so now the person and the brush, so the brush has been added to this mask. So any edits that I make to this mask are going to apply equally to those things that are selected which is super cool because you can, that's why like subtracting and intersecting, you don't have to keep making the same edits over and over. You just sort of build a collection of things under under this mask heading, basically. 
I hope that answered it. Yeah, um, we have more masking questions. Okay. Uh, when using masking in various parts of an image, can you change the order if you want a certain effect or do you need to eliminate what you've done and start over? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, it's a very good question that I'm not, uh, let's see, let's say, let's select background. Um, I, I don't think, you can't change the order. What you can do is, um, you know, use, oh, well, never mind. So you, you can change the order of, of, of the components in here, um, although I'm not sure how often that would be useful. Um, but what you're mostly doing is you're, you're just using the, the add and subtract and the intersect to, to refine what that mask is. So I hope that I hope that answers the question. It's it's not like layers, like it looks like layers. And especially if you've used Photoshop in the past, like you want to think in layers, but Lightroom has never really done layers. And so masks are just like like different pieces on your image that are 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 being edited in a limited way. I hope that makes sense. That makes sense to me. I just learned something. <laughs> um, Christopher, who had asked the last second to last question said, oh my God, thank you. I have been struggling with what he asked with ice hockey pictures and the sticks not getting picked up. So thank you yes. for answering that. Yeah. And, and actually the, the, the object selection, um, will, will be really helpful for that because then you're not, you're not having to like paint every little tiny little pixel. You can just say, Hey, here's a, here's the thing. And like, it may not know that that's a hockey stick. But it will be able to tell that this is where uh, you know a, a defined edge is, um, and so I, I mean you you can add a whole bunch of add and subtract and add and, add, add and subtract brushes to refine things if you want. You can like really drill down if you need to, um, which is which is also good. Most of what these do um, are most of what these do. Most of these are going to you know speed up the selection of things like that. Okay. Um, and Andre uh, wanted to know if he can mask complicated objects like trees with the AI methods. Mm. Uh, yes. Although I, I think it's going to be, again, like your, your mileage will vary. So for example, all right, let's say if I've edited no masks. Um, and I just want to uh, mask this tree, I would say uh, I would make an object mask. And let's just see. I mean, it might be a little confused because there are other trees behind it, but who knows? We'll see. It's a little bit of a sloppy mask, but it's it's done a pretty good job of of catching these edges up here and not just grabbing the trees behind. So definitely give it a try. Um, again, you know, something that that the software is likely to understand, uh, you know, a person, a car, a tree, a bush, uh, you know, a, I don't know what else, um, an airplane. Uh, try it with, with the object mask. And then, you know, we can always go in and say, uh, you know, actually, I want a little bit more of, of, of the trunk added. So I can say maybe add either more objects or with the brush and, you know, do that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, this question comes from Andy, and this is when you were uh, editing the portrait mm -hmm. and she, they, Andy, uh, asked, can those same applications be used in wildlife? I don't photograph people, but do primarily wildlife. Um, yes, definitely. So um, I, I think uh, trying to use a preset where it's going to be looking for a person is is, is not going to be the case. But again, using that that object uh, um, object mask, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I don't think I have an example image of like say you know. Well, it might understand like like where the eyes of a dog are, uh, dog or cat, just because those are more familiar. Um, that's a very good question. Um, you can absolutely try and see, um, but the like 
like eyes in particular, if you want to like like bring out the eyes of say a, a bird or something, um, I don't know that it's looking for that. So you may have to you know just paint in where that is or or use the object selection tool to um, to to grab the eye and it will you know look at like where the obvious edges are. Um, I know that that there are there are cameras now that are using AI for you know like like bird eye autofocus and and being able to you know automatically focus on wildlife. Um, I don't know if that extends to Lightroom yet. But I, I think it will do pets, but I'm not 100% sure offhand. Okay. Uh, Andy is here. So if they have any follow-up questions, maybe they'll put those in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, another question from Dale. Does Lightroom AI tech help us now with image sharpening in Lightroom? Um, that's a very good question. Um <laughs> I don't think that there are any like AI processing of sharpening. It'll definitely help in terms of selecting an area to sharpen, uh, you know, like a person, for example. Um, but I don't think there, there are any specific sharpening. Let's see if I go here. Um, like we're still dealing with just sort of regular regular sharpening tools. Um, I don't think there's there's any specific AI processing. Um, other than I will say, um, so that the the denoise um, noise reduction. So what that is that is the uh, where is it the enhance uh, dialog. And so like, like we don't actually have to do denoise, we can do what's called raw details. And what this does is that will just reprocess the raw file um, in a slightly better, but slower way. So um, sometimes this will be helpful. Uh, like for example, um, Fuji, Fuji images with lots of foliage in the background can get sort of wormy, noisy. And, and that's like one of the one reason people, you'll hear people say like, don't put Fuji images into Lightroom because it, it destroys them. Um, that's not the truth, but there are some images where you'll, you'll get this sort of artifacting that maybe running raw details will, will clean that up a bit. Um, there's also an app called um, uh, DxO Pure Raw. I think that's the right name um, that I've used quite a bit on something um, again, like not this one in particular, but other shots where, you know, you've got fall foliage in the background and it's, um, you know, can look a little bit, a little bit painterly. And so being able to, to reprocess that, like, like pure raw does a good job of that. It's, it's like running enhance, but a little bit better. Hope okay. that answers the question. This question comes, next question comes from Chris Owen. What is more important to Lightroom performance in a Windows PC, RAM or CPU? Can you suggest minimums for good Lightroom performance? Mm, that is a very good question. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, uh, not just because I'm plugging the book, but uh, hey, I'm here to plug my book. Um, there is a, a chapter in the back on performance. Um, I would say, well, so when you're talking about CPU versus RAM, I think you have to think about those together. Um, there's a question of, of CPU versus GPU. Um, I would say having more RAM is always better, especially in a Windows PC. Um, although I, I will make the disclaimer that I primarily use a Mac, so I've not used a whole lot of like high-end uh, PCs, but the way Lightroom handles things is still mostly CPU driven, not not entirely. And there, there are parts of the, the develop module that are taking advantage of a GPU, the, the graphics processor um, in, in other ways. Um, and, and also like, you know, the denoise, for example, like that's, that's really hitting the, the GPU processing pretty hard. Um, and, you know, if there are any 
uh, neural chips that that um, streamline that sort of, of processing. Um, but I would say, like, if you had to make the choice between a, a faster CPU and you know paying extra money for more GPU, right now you're going to see more bang for your buck from a CPU. Um, and if you can add more RAM to it, that's great because like it's all processor intensive. Um, if if there are people here who use uh, PCs that are more knowledgeable about that, um, feel free to contradict me. But that's that's my general impression. And uh, honestly, I'd have to go look in the book to see what I said about it. But yeah. Okay. Um, we have two more questions. I'm going to ask okay. a shorter question first. And maybe for the last question, you I don't know if you want to screen share or maybe do you, Jeff, do you have your book near you? I do. Okay, then so why don't you, uh, you can stop screen sharing. Um, Linda wants to confirm that uh, AI does not work on Heath or JPEGs. Is that correct? Um, not correct. Um, so the, some of the AI features, actually specifically the, the, the denoise uh, will not work on those. And that's only because what denoise is doing is it's, it's taking the raw data, like, like the raw ones and zeros before it's even turned into an image and it's reprocessing that. And so um, there's in a raw file, raw files typically include information about the type of noise that the sensor creates, which allows the software to, to, to work with that. Um, with a, with a HEF or, or, or a JPEG, you don't have that. Um, but everything else that I showed here um, it, it doesn't really matter what format the image is because it's it's scanning what's there and building what it, it understands of the image and working with that. So determining where a subject is or um, et cetera. I, I can't think of any other AI-based feature in Lightroom that would have a limitation um, Oh, and other than that, that that raw details that I showed, um, again, where that's it's reprocessing the raw file from from the beginning. Um, yeah, maybe the maybe the the the, the upscaling um, also requires raw, but I'm not sure offhand. But pretty much, yeah. If you're not shooting raw, that's okay. You still have tons and tons and tons of options. Okay, thank you. Uh, now for our last question. I think this will wrap us up neatly. And uh, it's a great plug for the book. We did not plant this question. Larry asks, can you discuss the format of your book? Is it more or less a linear tutorial or a task-oriented reference? Please give us the overview. Okay. Uh, great question. And I love uh, being able to answer this question because this is the magic of the, the course and compendium format. So there, there are, I think now five or six, uh, books in this series. And, uh, what's cool about it is the first part of it, let's see if I can, so basically like, like, like the, the first sections of, all right, my, my own little blurring is not working, but, um, is, is the course. So it is, um, you know, step by step. So, uh, you you buy the book, you go to the page that's linked in the book, and you download all the images that are being used here. So these these are my images that you get to work on, and you you just follow it step by step. And so doing that, you will learn a good overview of all all of the editing in in Lightroom. So tone, color, masking, all of that, and you get to use the images that I'm showing. So that is very much like a course course. And then the compendium part, which is like the last two thirds of the of the book, is very much the okay. I I got the idea of masking, for example, um, but this just showed me how to mask these specific tools. Now I can turn back to the compendium section on masking and get more detail about how it works and you know all the other features that maybe were not shown in the course section because you know we're just trying to give you the good introduction, the hands-on introduction to it. So I, I I love this format because it's got both. You have literally me walking you through hand, 
hand by hand, step by step, here's the image, do exactly this, this is what the result will be. And then the, the latter part of the book is, okay, now that I know that, I can get more information or I can, you know, reference when I'm, you know, working on my own images and I'm like, I don't remember how curves work. Well, okay, here's a little, here's a big explanation. Like what's the histogram? Well, a whole lot of information on how to read the histogram and how to use it as you're editing, that sort of thing. Great, thank you. And Linda says, I have several books in this format and they are great reference and learning tools. Thanks, Linda. Uh, and thank you, Jeff. Thank you for writing this book. We're so glad to add it to our our lineup. Um, thank you for this webinar and thank you to all of our attendees who've stayed with us this long. Um, it's been really fun and interactive and we can't wait to have you back in January. Yes, yes. I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, make sure you check it out. Uh, sign up. It's going to be a lot of fun. I've got a whole bunch of, you know, middling images that have promise and, and we're going to turn them into great images uh, because we're not all great photographers or we are, we are all great photographers that don't always shoot great photos all the time. And so it's really great to, to know what I can do with it. That that's the key. So here, here, thank you all for coming. This has been great. And also thank you for the people who are going to uh, watch this later who couldn't watch it live. And um, uh, if you have any uh, further questions that I wasn't able to answer, feel free to email me, jeff at jeffcarlson.com, and I will do my best to reply. Great. And this is where we get to say, see you next year. <gasps> oh, my God. It's right. <laughs> see you next year. <laughs> Happy holidays and take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.